So as I was saying, uh, we're in the middle of a sermon series called Urban Legends. In this series, we've been talking about some myths that we believe as truth. And I'm going to continue this series by talking about the urban legend, do not judge. You know, if we're not reading our Bibles on a regular basis, if we're not going to church regularly, sometimes it's easy for us to believe some things about Christianity or about God or about the Bible that might sound good, even though they're not actually true. So we're going to take a look at the urban legend, do not judge, and see what the Bible has to say about that. I want to start my message by talking about the fact that I love tattoos. Love tattoos. I know that might sound like a random phrase, but bear with me here. I love tattoos. I only have one tattoo, but I'm planning to get more tattoos. If I had it my way, I'd probably get a full sleeve tattoo, but in my line of work, that's generally frowned upon, so for the time being, I'll keep my tattoos covered. Okay. Now, I would venture to say that all of you made a judgment about me right now based on my statement on tattoos. You're judging me right now one way or another, right? We make judgments all the time about people. We're constantly judging people. We judge our hairstylist and whether we want to keep seeing her. After church today, we're going to go out and have some lunch, and if we go to a restaurant, we're going to judge our waiter and the job he's doing, and if we want to give him a good tip. We judge Judge Judy and Judge Joe Brown and all the other judge shows, and if we want to keep watching them. You're judging the job I'm doing so far delivering this message, and you made a judgment about my statement on tattoos. So since we're on the topic of judging and for the time being about tattoos, let's have a little fun this morning and let's judge some failed tattoos together and then we'll bring things full circle and really get into the message. So let's bring up the first picture here. Okay, now this is a beautiful scripture tattoo. It would be beautiful if it said Psalms 23.4, but it is misspelled and says slams. 23, 4. Of course, we all know Slams is the lesser known book of poetry written by King David. What do we have next? Oh, yes, the very lovely Regret Nothing tattoo. Regret nothing except for the fact you forgot a letter T and now it says Regret No King. What do we have next? Oh, yes, the uh, very responsible, the very responsible plan ahead tattoo except. You failed to plan for the fact that you needed one more knuckle. <laughs> Maybe next time. Oh, and finally, the ever popular Only God Can Judge Me tattoo. You just better hope that God isn't judging your spelling skills because last time I checked, the word judge had a letter D in it. So now it says, Only God Can Judge Me? Only, only God Can Juggy Me? Only God Can Juggy Me. Is that, is that true? Is that, is that true? Is God the only one that can juggy us? <laughs> no, seriously, is God the only one that can judge us? We hear people say things like, don't judge me. Or maybe we say things like, well, who am I to judge? But what does scripture say? What do we see in the Bible? That's what we're going to look into this morning. I want to start off by talking about the fact that God is the ultimate judge. God is the ultimate judge. I want to make that crystal clear this morning. God is the supreme judge of everyone, and he's the only one with the power to determine right and wrong motives and behaviors. We see plenty of scriptures throughout the Bible as God being judge. In the Old Testament, there are many references to God as judge, and these are just a few of them. Psalm 9-8. Again, that's Psalms, not Slams 9-8. Psalms 9-8. He shall judge the world in righteousness, and he shall administer judgments for the people in uprightness. Psalm 56, let the heavens declare his righteousness, for God himself is judge. Isaiah 33, 22, for the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king, he will save us. So those are just a few examples of God as judge in the Old Testament of the Bible. When we get to the New Testament of the Bible, we see that God the Father has passed authority to judge onto his son, Jesus. And there are scriptures that support that. Here are just a couple scriptures of Jesus' judge. John 5, 22, 
For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. Acts 17, 31. Because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained, he has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. Of course, that's talking about Jesus. As these verses demonstrate, the Bible makes it very clear that one day Jesus is going to judge everyone. And he's going to judge us based on whether we accepted or rejected him as the Son of God. Jesus is the Son of God, and that's something I believe with all of my heart. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that he died for my sins and that he rose again so that I could have eternal life with him one day. I believe him when he says that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father except through him. And if you call yourself a Christian this morning, it's because you believe that too. And that can lead to some potentially awkward conversations with people who don't share those beliefs, people who don't agree with us. And that brings us to my second area of focus this morning, hypocritical judgment versus righteous judgment. Hypocritical judgment versus righteous judgment. When we lovingly present the gospel message to someone, when we tell someone that Jesus died for their sins and rose again so that they can go to heaven, we're essentially judging that person, right? We're judging that person. We're making a judgment not based on our own opinion of what we think the condition of their soul is. No, it's not based on our opinion. It's based on Scripture. The judgment we're making is based on Scripture. And that judgment can be offensive to some people. People will sometimes argue with us. They'll respond by saying things like, well, I'm a good person. I live a good life. Who are you to judge me and tell me that I need Jesus? Or maybe they respond by saying things like, well, doesn't your Bible say, do not judge so that you're not judged? How many of you have ever had someone say something like that to you? I remember working as a TV news reporter years ago. Now, this was before the U.S. Supreme Court made the decision to allow same-sex marriage in the United States. You might recall that before the, the Supreme Court made that decision, uh, there were some states in the country where same-sex marriage was not legal, and there were some states where it was legal. Here in Ohio, it was not legal. And at the time, there were some groups who were trying to get a same-sex issue on the ballot so that same-sex marriage would be legal. And my TV station sent me out to cover uh, one of these groups that was trying to get an issue on the ballot to make it legal. And they were in the middle of a strategizing session. They were talking about how they were going to go door-to-door -door and try to get people to sign their petition to get that issue on the ballot. I remember being in that room and seeing that they had someone coaching them on how to go door-to-door. And that person said, you know, you might knock on a door and a Christian will answer and they'll say, sorry, I can't sign your petition. It's against my beliefs to support same-sex marriage. And the coach said, you can respond by saying, well, your Bible says do not judge. So you probably shouldn't judge the fact that these two people love each other and should be able to get married. So, is do not judge in the Bible? And if so, is it possible that that verse was taken out of context? Well, I'd like for you to turn in your Bibles this morning to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. It's always important to remember, to look at the entire context of a verse. It can be dangerous sometimes to just take a verse or a part of a verse and use it to support your argument. You need to look at what's before the verse and what's after the verse. Look at the entire context of the verse. In Matthew chapter 7, this is Jesus talking. So let's see what Jesus had to say here. We'll start in verse 1. Judge not that you be not judged. That's the verse we're talking about. But there's more to the story here, so let's keep reading. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye? And look, a plank is in your own eye. Hypocrite. First, remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Jesus here wasn't saying not to judge. Jesus wasn't saying not to judge. He was teaching us how to judge. He was telling us to avoid being a hypocrite with the way that we judge other people. 
If we're judging a certain sin in someone else's life, when we're dealing with that sin ourselves, we first need to take care of the sin problem in our own lives, allow God to change us and remove that sin from us, and then we can call out the sin in someone else's life. To go any other route would be a hypocrite. Jesus is telling us not to be hypocrites. You might not know this, but the uh, entire New Testament was written in Greek. And the Greek word for judge here is the word krino. The Greek word krino means to distinguish, to decide, to try, condemn, or punish. To try, condemn, or punish. It seems to be a strong warning from Jesus here that it is not our place to condemn people. If you want to substitute that word, you could have Jesus say, condemn not so that you are not condemned. We need to be careful that we are not self-righteous people who are going to condemn anyone who's not as righteous as we are. Now that same Greek word, krino, is found elsewhere in the New Testament. If you want to turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 2, we'll take another look at this instance of the Greek word krino being used. This is another set of verses that teaches us not to be hypocrites in the way that we judge other people. We as Christians sometimes have a bad, bad, bad reputation of being a bunch of judgmental hypocrites. I'm sure we've all met someone at one time or another who has been hurt by the church. They've been hurt because of the unfair judgments and the condemnation that they've received. And they've vowed to never set foot in a church again because they don't want to be associated with people like that. And I'm sure that breaks God's heart. That's not the way it's supposed to be. Let's go back to tattoos. Here at our church, we have several people who are all tatted up. And I think that's cool, personally. Here at our church, we don't judge on outward appearance. But you know, there are some churches where if you were to step through the doors covered in tattoos, people would raise their eyebrows. They'd look down on you. And maybe they would make assumptions of your lifestyle based on the fact you have tattoos. What's worse There are some churches in the U.S. where people would look down on you because you struggle with sin. Maybe you're coming to church for the first time because you know you have an issue with sin and you're trying to turn your life around, but people are looking down on you because you're not as quote-unquote holy as they are. That's not the way it's supposed to be. Nobody in this room is perfect. That's why we're at church. If we were perfect, we wouldn't need to be here. The Bible tells us not to be hypocrites with the way that we judge. That's what the Apostle Paul is warning us about in this set of verses here in Romans 2. Verse 1, You therefore have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else. For at whatever point you judge another, you're condemning yourself, because you who pass judgment do the same things. Now we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. So when you, a mere human being, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things, do you think you will escape God's judgment? Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? Paul is basically telling us here that if we judge others in this way, if we're being hypocrites, if we're being self-righteous, and we're condemning them for their sins when we have our own sin problem— We're going against God's way of doing things. You know, even if we were perfect, even if we had no sin in our lives, God would still not want us to take that self-righteous approach to dealing with other people. Paul says in verse 4 that we're showing contempt for the riches of God's kindness and patience when we act that way. Do you know what the word contempt means? That means to show utter disrespect. Paul's saying we're showing disrespect for the riches of God's kindness and his patience and his forgiveness when we act that way. God is so, so, so patient with us. He's so kind. He's so forgiving. We need to be the same way. The reason why he is so kind and so patient and forgiving is because he wants us to turn from our sin. God isn't excusing the sin here. He's not looking the other way, saying, oh, that's okay, keep sinning. No, it says here he's kind with us, he's patient with us, so that we will be led to repentance, so that we'll turn away from our sin. That's the approach we need to take with other people. Remember, we make hundreds of judgments a day. It's impossible for us not to judge, but we have to do it the right way. We can't be hypocrites. 
We need to be righteous judges. That's what Jesus calls us to be in John chapter 7, verse 24. He says, do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. So what does that mean? What is righteous judgment? I think righteous judgment first requires prayer. We need to pray. We need to ask God to search our hearts. We need to ask God to take a look at our hearts and to point out anything that is offensive to him. It goes back to what Jesus was saying. We need to remove the plank from our own eye. We need to take that two-by-four out of our own eye before we try to pick some dust out of somebody else's eye. We need to ask God to look at our hearts. We need to ask God to take that sin out of our lives. We need to repent, turn away from this sin, and then we're able to deal with someone else. Then we ask the Holy Spirit for guidance on how to handle that situation. That's what I believe it means to be a righteous judge. There's another verse in the New Testament that calls us to judge. 1 Corinthians 2.15, Paul writes, He that is spiritual judges all things. There's a different Greek word used for judge here. Previously, we talked about the Greek word krino that means to condemn. Here, the Greek word used is anakrino. It means to scrutinize, to investigate, to interrogate, to determine. Paul is saying here that spiritual people are supposed to be mature enough to be able to discern when something is right and when something is wrong. We need to be able to make that determination when something is right and when something is wrong. In today's culture, that would not be considered politically correct. We live in a, a time and age when we're told that there is no absolute truth. We're told that nothing is absolutely right, nothing is absolutely wrong. We're being told that everything is relative. We're told that what's right for me might be wrong for you, and what's wrong for me might be right for you. But the Bible tells us clearly that some things are right and some things are wrong. We need to be able to make that determination. Maybe we have a friend who's making a habit of going out and getting drunk all the time. Maybe we have a friend who's uh, living in sexual sin and they've become comfortable with that sin and they've become comfortable with that lifestyle and they're not willing to turn away from it. Maybe we have a friend who's been gossiping about people. According to the Bible, it's our responsibility to judge that situation, to speak the truth in love in the hopes that our friend will turn away from their sin. Ephesians 4.15 tells us that speaking the truth in love is a sign of spiritual maturity. What does it mean to speak the truth in love? It means more than just speaking words. Speaking the tr truth in love includes our tone of voice. It includes our body language. It includes how we say things, when we say things. It would not be speaking the truth in love if I were to call out my friend for the way they've been living in a group of other people. Hey, you're struggling with that. No, that's not speaking the truth in love. Speaking of the truth in love is to privately reach out to that person and say, hey, I've seen you've been doing this, this, you know, this activity. I, I see you've been taking part in this. You know, you might not be aware, but the Bible says that's not what we're supposed to be doing. Um, I want to really help you here. That's to speak the truth in love. We need to tell our friends and family when they're messing up. We have to tell them. It's like watching someone run straight for a cliff. If you were to see a friend or family member running straight for a cliff, you see the cliff there, you see them running full speed ahead, would you just sit there? Would you just sit back and say, well, I wouldn't do it, but who am I to judge? No. Would you say something like, well... Running off a cliff is wrong for me, but they need to be able to decide if it's right or wrong for them. No, you'd stop them. You'd shout, stop, you're running straight towards a cliff. You'd probably run after them and try to stop them. You'd tackle them. Can you imagine watching your friend running towards obvious danger and just sitting there doing nothing to stop them? What kind of friend would you be? If you're willing to stop a friend from running towards a cliff, why wouldn't you be willing to stop your friend from ruining their life in another way, right? Being a righteous judge means that you are lovingly going to do the best that you can to turn your friends away from their sin. So as we wrap up this morning, I just want to dispel the urban legend that we are not to judge. 
anyone who uses the phrase, do not judge, is likely taking that verse out of context. It's clear from the Bible that we are called to judge, but we're called to do it righteously and not as hypocrites. We as believers in Christ should examine our own lives regularly and then lovingly challenge our Christian brothers and sisters who are committing sin. To do this, we have to be bold for Christ, but we have to also be humble. We have to be loving. We have to be kind. We need to be able to take a stand and say, this is right, this is wrong. We need to be able to make wise decisions to help our friends and family do the same. As Christians, we should judge, but let's take our lead from the Lord and lean on the Holy Spirit to guide us. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for who you are. I thank you that you are so loving, so patient, so kind. I thank you for your forgiveness. Come, Holy Spirit. Lord God, I, I want to pray for the people right now who have been hurt by unfair judgment, who have been hurt by condemnation. There's a problem within the church in this country, Lord, when it comes to judgment and how to judge. And people have been hurt tremendously. So, Lord, I just want to pray for anyone in this room who's been hurt by the church, Lord, who's been hurt by that unfair judgment. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would work in their hearts right now, that you bring healing. Just minister to them this morning, Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray for those who are struggling with how to judge. those who have someone in their life, a friend or a family member who's living in sin and they're struggling with how to talk to those people, Lord. I pray that you would give them the wisdom in how to speak the truth in love. That you'd give them the right words to say so that they can lead their friends, that they can lead their family members towards repentance, Lord. Use them as your hands and your feet here on the earth, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We talked about God's loving kindness. We talked about his patience, his forgiveness. He's so patient with us because he wants us to repent from our sins. If you're here this morning, I want to give you that opportunity. If you've never turned away from your sin, if you've never confessed your sin and your need for a Savior, today can be your day. There is no condemnation here. We've all had our own struggles with sin. Most of us in this room have committed our lives to Jesus. We've confessed our sin and said, Jesus, we need you. You're the only hope that we have for salvation. We want you to be our Savior. If you're in this room and you haven't made that decision for Christ, I want to give you that opportunity this morning. God's given us so many chances. He continues to give us those opportunities to turn from our sin. He does it because he loves us and he wants to spend eternity with us. So if you're here this morning and you want that, you want to say, I'm done with my sin. I want Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. I want him to wash away my sin. I want to spend eternity with him. If you could just be bold enough to raise your hand, I want to pray for you. If there's anyone this morning who wants to make that decision. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I thank you for those who want to make that decision to follow you. They're saying, I'm done. I'm done living a life for myself. I want to live my life for you. Lord, I pray your blessing on them. Pray for your Holy Spirit to fill them from head to toe. I pray that they would just feel a sense of your peace, your forgiveness, your love. Help us, Lord. Help us to be the people you want us to be. Help us not to be hypocrites, Lord. 
Help us to be righteous judges for you, for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Gently to my knees, and I am lost away.